Good evening, friends, ladies and gentlemen. You can hold your applause until later. You might rather throw tomatoes at me. I was, we were afraid that some people might be leaving the lecture because this was the first slide. And I wanted simply to stick to the theme of uh, honoring Robin Haig and my remarks last night in thinking about our relationship to the Swedish tradition of scholarship, classical and prehistoric, and the Swedish Institute. And the irony of this is that at Bryn Mawr, because we've had many relationships thanks to Carl Nylander teaching so many years at Bryn Mawr, we've had a diff an exchange. And as I pointed out, Kyle Phillips, who introduced me to Etruscan studies and took me on an excavation at Poggio Civitate in Tuscany in 1968 and again in 1971, was a student of Eric Schurkvist and a great friend of Carl Eric Oestenberg. And there in hangs a tale that I told last night about um, my introduction to the tradition of Swedish scholarship. And it's simply ironic and at the same time wonderful that today we have a special lecture at Bryn Mawr, the C. Densmore Curtis lecture. C. Densmore Curtis was an, an archaeologist who uh, was at the American Academy at Rome and did Italian archaeology. And uh, uh, an anonymous donor decided to endow a lectureship that graduate students could hold to invite a scholar of significance to Bryn Mawr. And this year it's been Gunnel Ekroth. And her lecture was a couple hours ago at Bryn Mawr. So the irony is that I'm speaking here tonight uh, at the Swedish Institute, <laughs> giving a lecture as a, an emeritus Bryn Mawr professor. But my real theme again tonight is to continue with uh, my thinking about the history of the Mycenaean Palace as an archaeological artifact. And last night I talked about the corridor plan and how it came into being and informed the framework for the formal plan of the palace itself. But tonight I want to talk about how the palaces got dressed up and we leave behind a lot of settlements that didn't participate as strongly in the palatial world and turn our attention to the palace as a formal product, first looking at Ashler masonry and then looking at building traditions, particularly in and around Mycenae, and then moving on to consider how the palace responded as an architectural product, as a product of material expression by the Mycenaean overlords to different foreign technologies. Um, and that will bring me to the end of my thinking about this particular issue. So we can begin by thinking about the LH3 Asler Palace of, of Nestor at Pilos as explained to us in the marvelous work by Michael Nelson, which was published in full in 2017. And in black, in outline, we can see what he identified as the LH3A remains of the palace. So it's an outline of the palace that frames the LH3B final version of the palace that we know better. And the, there's a kind of question mark in the center here. What did it look like? And I would argue that it probably looked like the later palace. That is, it had the, the, the same design, which is a corridor structure with a megaron or freestanding rectangular building with corridors and flanking rooms off the side in the center. And how do we get from that to the fully developed and kind of perfect plan of the palace as laid out in Tiran's and as explained by Josef Moran as a ritual processional space that leads one through, from, through corridors into courtyards, through propyla, into another courtyard, through another propylon, into a courtyard centered on the great Megaron at the center. And that's really what I want to examine tonight, and I'll end up talking about processions. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the definition of Ashler masonry in the prehistoric period, it's not the same as it is in classical antiquity. These are not cut quadrilateral blocks. Instead, these are blocks that are cut with an anatherosis that shows on the face, but they're cut back diagonally. So they only dress it out on the face. And if you look in this upper photograph, from Wace's explorations of the retaining wall around the tumulus that probably covered 
the tomb of Atreus, there was a ashlar retaining wall circularly holding a tumulus over the tomb when it was filled in. And you'll see that there's a swallowtail cutting because there was a beam that was inserted into the terrace to keep it steady. So that's a feature of ashlar masonry, and it's Minoan in form. And what do these walls look like? Well, the photograph that you see below is a typical coarse Mycenaean palace ashlar wall, except what I'm showing you is the Sacello at Ayatriada, which is an LM3 version of such a wall, and I'll return to that subject a little bit later in the talk. Just to help frame where we are, uh, I have give here a comparative chronology of places, and I'm using the later, uh, the later chronology, the downdating chronology. Um, some of my numbers are not what some people would want them to be, but I just wanted to give you an impression. And I've put the neo-palatial period in green and dates. So that's a really important period. And the palaces with ashlar masonry are elevated in the diagram because they go back into the proto-palatial period. But the neo-palatial palaces are the, the, the source for this masonry tradition that mainlanders developing their own tradition, as I argued last night, came in contact with between MH3 and LH2A, and probably earlier than that, as they made their way willy-nilly, some of them, to Crete and then returned to the mainland. And as I also argued last night, the built chamber tombs that Nicholas Papadimitriou pulls into consideration cover the whole wide variety of architectural expression during this transitional period, MH3 down to LH2A, that shows this tremendous diversity of architectural expression in the mortuary world where everything is beginning to be changed and called into question as social forces and the political economy of the neo-palatial period is, is asserting itself and really uh, bringing us into this period we call early Mycenaean. So built chamber tombs in an architectural expression of different groups that are distinguishing themselves, separating themselves from other people in the community. And in architectural terms, that is happening as well, as I argued last night. And it results in the formation of the corridor house that's exemplified by the Menelaean Mansion One of LH2B date. And then that flows into the Mycenaean palaces, the subject of my lecture tonight, while the Tholos and chamber tomb become the formalized expression of architectural facilities of burial in the Mycenaean world and take us all the way down to the, the, the end of the late Bronze Age. In the middle of this is the monopalatial period. And for, for all of you who are in a G and prehistory, that means that is the time that Linear B is being written for administrative purposes at Knossos and throughout most of Crete so we have a completely different political order and political economy being established in Crete, and we have these palaces under, let's say, Mycenaean control. And I think of that as a more gradual process, even though it's accentuated by the LM1B destructions across so much of Crete. And then it is bracketed at the end by the destruction of the palace at Knossos, which is... L, early LM3A2, it could be a little bit later in terms of architecture. It doesn't make that much difference how we view it. It flows into the final palatial period in Crete and the period of the palaces on the mainland. So that's simply a framework that you can keep in mind as I go forward. And last night I argued that we have a mainland tradition at the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age uh, that we need to pay attention to. It's beginning to emerge and it will flow into and establishes the boundaries for the mainland of what Tom Tarcheron describes as a Mycenaean maritime culture region that extends out in its fullest expression across the Aegean and over to southwestern Anatolia. But I think of the mainland tradition in architectural terms is useful because it also as I argued last night, uh, supplements these other networks that Cyprian Broodbank outlined as we make the transition out of the early Bronze Age into the Middle Bronze Age. 
and, and people in these different regions of the Aegean world begin to reconnect and interact with each other. And Crete, of course, is driving this as the palace periods, protopalatial and then neopalatial, take on their form and serve as magnets attracting people to the center of urban and religious and economic expression that Crete is driving in its contact with the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly because of its trade via sailing vessels from Crete into the Eastern Mediterranean, to Cyprus and along the Levant, and also, of course, to Egypt. Last night, I emphasized as a part of the outcome of the tradition that is developing throughout the Middle Bronze Age, as we get into LH1 and then into LH2, there's an increase in population and there's also a change in social dynamics. And it's driven uh, by all kinds of things that are happening in the Aegean world and it's manifested in architecture, for example, by Asine, the lower town, being filled out with lots of freestanding rectangular buildings that are put together side by side with alleys in between them, and it forms a small village. And as that happens, we find other things beginning to, to develop as well. Uh, there's an enlargement of many of these buildings, and I illustrate this uh, ex excavated building that uh, Lena Papazoglu did at Egeon, this LH1 building that has a freestanding rectangular three-roomed building in the center with rooms off to one side and rooms off to the other side. Uh, and that's very similar to what crystallizes in Mansion 1 of the Menelaean. This is a rubble form of architecture, as I emphasized last night, and that is something I want to keep in mind tonight. We're talking primarily about rubble architecture. So when we dress it up, we're doing something different. And I also pointed out uh, by using Sophia Vudsaki's useful diagrams of MH3 through LH12 mortuary practices, that the elaboration of, of, of burial facilities such as the shaft graves and the built tombs are, hold multiple burials and are often found in cemeteries and represent the outcome of a period of extreme uh, social disruption and testing and invention that happens in a period where there aren't really any rules about how people express themselves in social and political economic terms. They're experimenting, especially as they differentiate themselves in, in social terms one from another. Uh, and this is particularly understood in the wonderful study by Nicholas Papadimitriou of 2000 that takes all of these built chamber tombs and brings them together to talk about a way of experimenting with displays of mortuary position and prestige via tomb architecture, such as this remarkable complex at, of LH1 at Mitru, uh, or of the well-known tombs from Eleusis, particularly the built gamma-shaped tombs, or the equally well-known remarkable tombs of uh, five and four and one and two from Thorikos. And I, there's many others that we could illustrate, but they simply tell us that during this period, this intensification of change, as Sophia puts it, that results in extramural cemeteries and larger graves that contain richer offerings and multiple burials, we move forward into a period of competition between emerging centers and a more crystallization of social difference among people, what she categorizes as the rise of, of petty kingdoms during LH2, and which time we see all that variety in architectural mortuary expression begin to become formalized in built tholos tombs and in mortuary display uh, and in chamber tomb cemeteries. And our subject this evening is then the appearance of the palatial system and I will talk more about how mortuary display is elaborated under those conditions between, uh, during the last two centuries of the, of the late Bronze Age. Now, what's driving all this is the axis mundi of the Aegean world, Knossos. And I, I refer to the work of Jeffrey Souls here back in 1995, where he argued 
that Knossos settled at the very beginning of the Neolithic and continuously settled is the absolute center and axis of the Aegean world. And if we think that we're moving as we move down through the Bronze Age down to its ter termination, through time, here is the most ancient of all places around which ritual and myth center. And it's a place that has tremendous legitimacy because of its antiquity and everything that's attached to it. And we, in fact, Leonard Palmer long ago said, well, we really need to look at the throne room. That must be a Mycenaean center when the Mycenaeans took over. And we've sort of returned to that. Moran has suggested, well, let's look at the throne room as a kind of model for the Mycenaean palace. Not an architectural model, but in terms of a centralizing place that takes on significance. I would say that's a very good idea, but I also don't want to ignore the areas that we don't actually have so well preserved, notably in green across the corridor from the central court at Knossos, that great east room, the plan of which we don't know, but we do know that there was a, a, a molded uh, ter, uh, fr uh, a fresco of a, of a griffin tied to a post which is always a symbol of a deity somewhere in, in, in the region. So that's a, we just should keep that in mind, not least because we have all of these throne room-like rooms, Minoan halls, within the residential sector in, in the stories that are attached as you go down through the grand staircase. How we understand that is just something to keep in mind. However, there is such a good argument to, argue, to, to suggest that the throne room really is a central place, not least because we know it was occupied as a ritual space from at least MM1A forward continuously. And also because, as Mabel Lang uh, showed us when publishing the frescoes from Pylos, the whole notion of a throne flanked by griffins is something that shows up in the palace of Nestor at Pylos in the late 3B period, and that is redolent with thinking of the throne room as being the appropriate place for this. There's a photograph of Evan's excavation of the throne itself, so we know it's a real thing. Um, and that's a, that's a good place to turn and think then more about what's going on at, in Crete in architectural terms, especially in terms of Asher masonry and its development and how it's understood. And so I turn back to the notion of the expression of differentiation in burial architecture. And the most remarkable thing uh, that's been much explicated by Laura Preston's dissertation in her articles, particularly the one on the Kefala tomb at Knossos of LM2 date, which is taking us into the very beginning of the monopalatial period, is that we have these remarkable monumental tombs built out of ashlar blocks in an expression that we don't, wouldn't otherwise think is Minoan, but much more Mycenaean. And this is just at the beginning of the time of the, of the building of the cutting and installation of chamber tomb cemeteries at Knossos, at Kanya, and elsewhere. So that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. And uh, to that we have the Isopata tomb and the rather problematic temple tomb. And at Kefala we also have a mason's mark uh, set into this Asher masonry. So this is a pure Minoan form of expression taken out of Minoan palaces and now built into a very impressive form of mortuary facility. And then we show up in Messenia, that very precocious era, uh, region during this era, as we are knowing increasingly from the work that Stocker and Davis are doing at Pilos, at Peristeria, where we have tomb one of LH2A date and mason's marks carved on an Asher facade of this Tholos tomb. And this is something that continues even in Messenia. Um, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, see here, see also Tragana, LH3A1. So this is very interesting because it, be, it, it suggests that Minoan masons are arriving and working and bringing this craft, technology, and style to Messenia at this time. This is a period of social competition, a disruption of the social order, as I talked about yesterday, 
And it's happening in the neo-palatial period and early monopalatial period in Crete. Built chamber tombs of LM3 through LM3A1 at Knossos, as we just looked at, and all of the chamber tomb cemeteries heading north all the way down to Poros, Kalsamba, the port. And also at Kalivia, at Festos, and the warrior tombs that show up at Hanya. And on the mainland, we have this expression that takes a longer time that I went through last night of all of these different tomb forms appearing and then formalizing in the tholos of the chamber tomb at the end of the period. So that's very important to put together to see that that social competition disruption is happening in both places and at some level simultaneously. What's remarkable is how Mycenae in particular with its nine Tholos tombs still stands out today. After all the excavation for the past century and a half, Mycenae is still outstanding. We have chamber tombs being established all over and discoveries such as the chamber tomb at Corinth really surprised us because it's early and it tells us that, that that tomb form is rapidly spread throughout at least the southern Peloponnesus, the Peloponnesus, uh, as well as really the Mycenaean tradition area that I am arguing about, extending all the way up to Thessaly. If we look at something like the Cato Fornos tomb, we see from Weiss's early work uh, that it utilizes conglomerate, which is a local stone at Mycenae, for the threshold and also regular limestone, and then porous limestone that is roughly coursed, as you see in this photograph. Uh, it's not ashen masonry, but it's a monumentalizing burial expression that separates the people who are buried within them out from everybody else in the populace. And then we have the tomb of Aegisthus and others that in fact have ashen facades, just as we saw from uh, Peristeria, so that the introduction of a Minoan kind of Ashur masonry is picked up by masons at Mycenae and carried forward in exactly the same manner that it was introduced in Mycenae. And it's then uh, developed in, as we get into the later tombs, and particularly an example here of the Clytemnestra tomb, because it's not merely that it's formalized in the conglomerate coarse masonry that outfits the dromos and the facade, the stomian of the tomb of Clytemnestra, as well as the interior chamber, but it is then surrounded by another one of these great poros retaining walls that holds the tumulus that mounds over it, as Lord William Taylor excavated and published in the BSA in 1955, and you see three courses of that Ashley masonry retaining that mound, and you have to think about the significance of that to the viewer approaching the tomb if it was closed and seeing this dressed ashlar white stone surrounding the tumulus over this great underground Tholos tomb that's also closed off by a conglomerate dromos blocking wall and the stomian is also built up with an ashlar blocking wall. So this is a this is a technology and a style that is uh, expressed in at Mycenae in very formal terms and uh, we also see it at the treasury of Atreus. This was, uh, Waste was excavating, and first he thought he discovered a house, but as you can see, what we have here are coping stones that Waste published in 1940 that sit on top of this wall. So it isn't simply several courses of masonry, it has a beautiful coping, and some of them have ma mason's marks on them as well. And they close off the dromos and also provide uh, a ring around the top of the Atreus Tholos. So this is a remarkable uh, development that is local to Mycenae, expressing in the final stages of the covering of a Tholos, a visual uh, announcement as one goes up to the citadel of these great burials in ways that are specific to Mycenae and its region. And we look around at places like Prosumna and Berbati and see also ashlar facades to the stomian of these tombs. So this is fairly widespread throughout the region that we could think is within the control of Mycenae as it's emerging as an important center. And this uh, chart, which you can just 
glance at simply shows for the earlier tombs the distribution of porous ashlar masonry in those tombs. It's a masonry form adapted by, adopted by ma ma masons at Mycenae with abundant quarries of local stone available to them and then adapted for their own needs. And this development of a monumentalizing architectural approach to burial is elaborated in the great three last tombs, the tomb of the Genii, the tomb of Atreus, the tomb of Clytemnestra, in a local stone conglomerate that begins to be put into the tombs as early as LH2B, expressly for use at Mycenae, and uh, becomes truly monumentalized in those last three tombs. So that's important to keep in mind because it's part of a local tradition that I will return to a little bit later in this presentation. Now, did I get ahead of myself there? Yes. So, let's return then to Ashler and the palaces. And this is again the work of Michael Nelson. And he simply tells us that the earliest evidence is near the end of the Middle Helladic, the Pano Anglian Ulse inhabitants began to quarry and shape porous limestone into squared blocks. And in the next major building phase in LH1, these were reused in a pseudo ashlar masonry style. And prior to their reuse, they must have been part of a coarse masonry building system, which unfortunately does not survive. Um, there's not really much to contest on that, except it's interesting that it tells us there's something going on that we don't understand even earlier than the evidence we have, for example, from Peristeria that we want to pay attention to if we can. Interestingly enough, this is very similar to what I talked about last night. There I suggested that at the Menelaean, the fragments of cut porous limestone blocks that Hector Catling published in wonderful detail with great illustrations and photographs are not Ashton masonry at all. They're playing around with cutting porous limestone into slabs and forms of cut masonry that would have elaborated and decorated a building prior to Mansion 1, LH2A or even earlier. But it's not really coarse Asher masonry, not at the Menelaean. And so if we really want to talk about that, we have to talk at the Menelaean about a rubble masonry tradition. Because when they built this building, they built it of rubble and reused many of those cut limestone blocks, but they didn't use them as a facing or a decoration in any way whatsoever, so far as we have preserved. In fact, this is really the tradition that I was talking about yesterday of rubble architecture, and for two stairway buildings, where there might even have been a stairway, as we see here in this lower uh, two narrow rooms at the Menelaean mansion, which makes sense because of the location of the mansion in the lower platform. Um, a second story makes a lot of sense, and there was the insertion of wooden beams already in this building. So that's something to keep in mind, and we'll return to it. They were experimenting, the Masons were experimenting, particularly the Masons at Mycenae, with different ways of cutting porous limestone. And that's not the same, but it does suggest they're playing around and inventing and trying to find different versions. And we have the remarkable tomb row from Mycenae that has these Near Eastern parallels, for example, to tombs at Ugarit. And somebody maybe knew about such tombs in the Levant and decided that they would bury one of their descendants. Uh, the burying group wanted to make some kind of special statement to the community that was present at the time of burial and produced this remarkable room. Burial that simply is different from all the other and looks like coarse Ashler masonry. So it's playing around with different traditions. But the real Minoan coarse masonry shows up at Pilos. That's what Michael Nelson shows us particularly by the fragments that he isolated that you see here in blue, which if you look at the ones in black, you realize they are on the orientation of the later palace. And this is an orthostate masonry. So he shows us first what the pseudo masonry looks like, and that's, that's building X down here on the old changing orientations. But the next stage is this uh, orthostate masonry. And that shows up in a very distinct style. Here we see a very important 
fragment of that masonry preserved in the photograph beneath room seven. Remember, this is the archives room on the same orientation as the palace. And the other ones that you see in the plan are also part of the plan of a later palace. And these are orthostate blocks set up with a mortise cut in them in the Minoan fashion and a double axe mason's mark. So this is very characteristic. We see one that's still, still standing within the latest stage of the palace at Pilos. So it's incorporated into the succeeding stages of the palace itself. And as he remarks uh, in, in, in his final publication, um, and I just allude to a recent discovery of LH2A, well stratified and dated uh, Ashner masonry that Stocker and Davis uncovered. But Michael Nelson says about this system, it's Minoan. It's very much the same components of a Minoan system that are found at Pilos. Orthostate slabs with mortises for horizontal beams and a rubble backing sitting on a sockle of cut stone. Some differences are noted. Minoan orthostate blocks tend to be larger and sockle blocks are more finely cut than those of the Apano Anglianos Palace. Okay, good enough. We must have some masons who either are playing around with this because they learned it in Crete, or maybe there were some Cretan masons who came and worked in the palace itself. That makes a lot of sense. Now the next phase that really is the origin of the palace proper is LH3A1. And in the beginning of my career, I wrote an article about terrace platforms, but more recently, uh, Adamantia Vasilogambru in the recently published Austrian conference, in thinking about the LH3A1 building that she's uncovered at Ios Vasilios, pulled together the LH3A1 terraces for platforms. And it's interesting, because just at the time that we see the palaces coming together as a formal plan, we have them appearing also as palace uh, platforms for formal buildings. Petzas House at Mycenae, Truntas House at Mycenae, probably Tiran's, which we'll look at a little bit later, the LH32B to 3A1 predecessor of the palace, slightly different orientation from the final palace, Ayos Vasilios, as Vasilo Gambu argues, and also that remarkable Cyclopean building at Iklana. So the one at Pilos that we know about um, is built, if you look at the blue here, and then I'll move into the next slide, there we see the form of the Ashler building, which we looked at before. This is a, an Ashler facade, uh, an otherwise rubble-built building, as I've argued for the Menelaean. And it's interesting, at the Menelaean, after the destruction of the LH2B Mansion 1, a 90-degree turn produces Mansion 2 in LH3A1 that actually uses the terrace the platform, the ruins of the first mansion as a terrace platform on which it sits. And here we have an elaborated corridor house structure with two of these rectangular buildings in the center with corridors on either side leading to adjacent rooms. So this is a more formalized version at the Menelaean. It's not a palace, but it certainly is um, expressing itself in terms that we can think of as being particularly formalized. And here we get to the LH3A1 monumental palace design at Pilos, where we have the fallen ashlar blocks of the northeastern facade that have incorporated in them some of the orthoscape blocks from the LH1 building. And we know that those blocks were set up in courses that would have impressed the visitor, particularly one coming from the northeast, from the Tholos tombs out to the northeast, straight into the gate that you can see on that side there. And here's a, I found this on Flickr, and it's a rather nice sort of visualization of what it might have looked like. But it really is a facade. And when we're talking about this, we can look um, at what probably was going on also at um, uh, Tiran's in LH2B to 3A1. And these are the remains of the terrace platforms that form the Oberburg at this time. Uh, these are very interesting remains as they develop, as Moran has shown us, and as we see here in their first appearance. It's not exactly the same plan that we have in the final palace. 
but it's all the outlines of it, with the great Ma Megaron looking into a court that faces a terrace platform uh, at the south, and the entrance is three meters lower. That's important to keep in mind. So that entrance right there is three meters lower, so you had to go up to get into it. So this is the first phase, LH3A1, for the palace at Tiryns on one of these platforms. And the actual evidence of an early palace is also embedded in the later structures. So when we look at the what Kurt Mueller and others call the residential sector out to the east of the Great Megaron in the final phase at, at Tiryns, if you see where the blue lines are, those are reused rubble and orthostate blocks built into the later palace. And so they're evidence of that predecessor and of the Asher masonry that uh, formed the facade of the palace. And that just brings us to the issue of planning and engineering. You can't build a building of this magnitude, of this degree of complexity with courts and corridors, roofs on one side, corridors on the other, um, without preparing for gathering all the water that's draining off the roofs, coming into the courtyards and draining it out. And so, in 19, the 1930 publication by Mueller of the palace, they mapped all the drains. So you've got architects and engineers thinking about this. The drains have to be put in first, then you build the building. And uh, uh, studies of the drainage plan at Pilos tell us the same thing. We don't have a real accurate map of the drains at Mycenae, but they're abundant. If you poke around, you can see lots of drains draining the citadel of Mycenae. So it might be Mycenae. So you have to think about the planning that goes into this kind of construction. Uh, and that's, these really announce these LH3A2 uh, phases of the palaces on the mainland of Greece. When we come to Mycenae, it's somewhat complicated, and I have an adapted diagram drawn from a plan that uh, Ken Wardle published in the uh, Mycenaeans up to date 2015. And I just want to draw your attention to the terrace wall, TW, here that's dotted. This was identified by George Milanos, published in uh, a number of articles where he reported on his work on the LH3A circuit wall that we see at, up at the top. And the gray phases represent the final phase of circuit wall construction that adds in the conglomerate built postern gate at the north and the great western, southwestern circuit wall with the Lion Gate uh, that encloses the, 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 uh, the cult center and the other buildings, the South House and the granary and the other buildings that were added that had been standing already since the 3A period. Uh, that terrace wall is, is interesting because it represents the area where the palace must have been established. And we don't have a lot for that, but we do have uh, some fragments that we can pay attention to. A very nice mortise doweled uh, anti-block from Chunta's house that represents the use of ashlar decorating that important structure. And then, in a really phenomenally interesting and remarkably original publication by, and study by Joe Shaw in the Ashler Conference volume that came out in 2020, he drew our attention to the great standing Asher wall in the courtyard of the Megaron of the palace at Mycenae, which you see in the photograph uh, up in the, this. And, and what you can see are the drawings of it in the left side as well as the plans, and then a restoration of what it looked like with these horizontal, large horizontal beams that were separating different courses of Asher masonry. And these uh, Asher blocks have uh, uh, swallowtail cutting, some of them, that have wood supports that are back holding the wall together. So he, he describes this here, the dowel cutting to hold the horizontal beam and the other two mortises are in the next lower course, which did not hold the horizontal beam. Shaw wanted to understand exactly where this masonry comes from. He understood it already from the work that Wace and others had done that I've already talked about with respect to the, the, the uh, use of Asher uh, for, the, for the retaining walls around the, 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 the treasuries, of the, the, the great Thalos tombs. But he turned his attention somewhere where most of us would not have been looking, to Ayatriada and to the Sicello, 
the shrine building at Ayatriala. And here's a drawing by Giuliano Bianco that shows this remarkable building with its ashlar facade. And I showed you this at the beginning of the lecture. Here it is. And here's the system. And what drew his attention was that big beam slot on the lower part. And he argues that what's being built at Ayatriata in LM3A and B is the same thing that we see at Mycenae because it is that period of Mycenaean rule or management of Crete. But it's appearing at Ayatriata not just once, but as he points out, when we look at the other LM3 buildings at Ayatriata, and he's drawing also on observations by Nicola Kukutsa, building at the Edificio Northwest that we see in the area of the circle has building P, which Kukutsa argued is attached to it. And when you look at it, what you really are looking at is building P is an administrative building of some kind. It's a, re a large rectangular building with a corridor. These are the basement rooms of it with a corridor and attached rooms off to the side. And it also has Asher masonry lining it, as shown in this photograph from Shaw's study. So we have another example of it, and it's really kind of Mycenaean in expression. So this is really interesting, because for the first time it brings Ayatriyada, which Shaw calls Patnito, from the Linear B tablets, into our purview, and it helps us understand this remarkable building A, B, C, D, this massive rectangular building that was laid over the villa, at I, the neo-palatial villa at Ayatriada, which, as Shaw argues, it shows us, also is another one of these Asher-built structures, almost certainly holding a big beam in place because the mortise cuttings you can see in the photograph are there. So this is a building that both Barbara Hayden and Nicola Kukutsa had said, isn't this also a Mycenaean structure? So this is very interesting because it brings palatial Ashler architecture together in a format in LM3 in Crete, together with what we're seeing appearing at the palaces on the mainland. Um, and this is then is a, a re the reconstruction from Wace's publication in 1949, an archeological history of Mycenae and the courtyard what he thought the palace courtyard looked like. This is probably how it appeared in the LH3B period. And I want to turn our attention then to the facade. So in my own work, the facade is outstanding because it has these huge Asher blocks that are set into this matrix that you can see in the diagram 207 there. And that's certainly the filling for beams that were set in there. This is a system of masonry that's very Mycenaean and is being used to elaborate these facades. And the masons who developed it are dressing out the rest of the Megaron in ways that also reflect Minoan practices. So for those of you who know, the entrance into Mycenae, across the threshold into the front porch going into the vestibule, alabaster slabs are lining it because they are resonate with Minoan architecture. And so when we then head north to the house of Cadmus, we find the same arrangement, and you see my restoration of a beam setting into these Asher blocks that bespeaks the same arrangement. It could have been groups of masons who were traveling from palace to palace doing this, and this is Natasha de Curry Hill's illustration of what it might have looked like with the beam set in place in her article in the BSA in 2002. And there are evidence of this also in the later phase of the palace at Pilos, where this photograph on the left, which is my photograph, shows striations of beams that were set on another Ashler uh, base that has mortises cuttings to hold the beam in place. And that's part of the entrance into the, into the Megaron complex at Pilos. So this is a very interesting system. Ashler is being used in facades only. It shows up at Ayatriada, possibly also at Knossos, and it shows up at Pilos, Mycenae, Tyrans, and Thebes. So we're, we're looking at groups of masons who really understand a way of dressing out the palaces in a way that reflects practices that are Minoan and are also being built in certain places in Crete itself during this period 
of the Mycenaean palaces on the mainland. And Shaw is arguing in here that there's what's particularly remarkable about this is a system of wooden beam emplacement that's not what we see in the, in the uh, neo-palatial period uh, in Crete. And that just brings me to a, another issue, and that's timbering in Mycenaean rubble architecture. And I've argued uh, in the 2006 article on the Mycenaean palace that this system of timbering is unlike anything that we see in the Cyclades or in Crete. And in fact, it's derived from an old Anatolian tradition that's recognizable at Beja Sultan, even in the early, later stages of the early Bronze Age, and by Taksin Uzguc in his excavations at Kultepe, where beams are inserted through the wall. And interestingly enough, this is exactly what Wilhelm Dirkfeld recognized in room uh, 46 at Tiryns, as he illustrates in this, in this drawing that he published in the Tiryns volume. And, it, and, and uh, Mueller photographs and publishes a photograph of beam slots that they cleaned out at Tiryns, where these beams go all the way through the wall. And I show you a photograph of beam slots that are preserved because of the burnt mud or clay around them, the mortar around them, when, when it built, burnt, it preserves those beams going all the way through. And they're stacked one on top of the other, as my reconstruction shows where the arrows are showing. And the same thing is happening at Trumta's house, quite a number of places. This was work that was actually done by Ken Shar in a master's uh, study at Lund, I think, way back in the 1960s. Thanks to Carl Nylander, I probably have one of the few copies of this terrific. Uh, he was the architect for Milanos at the time. And he observed this and wrote a master's thesis in Sweden on it that never was fully published, though he did publish one article on this subject. So this is really interesting because it brings into our discussion something I'll come back to, and that is connections with Anatolia. So mortuary, I want to come back now to the issue of mortuary architecture as an expression of legitimacy. And I want to look at conglomerate as a local resource. I'm bringing to your attention again this slide that shows the tomb of the genii, the Atreus Tholos, and the Clytemnestra Tholos, where conglomerate is used universally to express these great uh, tombs in a way that really is very much a Mycenaean product, uh, an explicit masonry tradition in, starting in LH382. And we know this because the geology of the Arbolid has great abundance of high quality conglomerate as you come out from the Tritos Pass. The next time you go through the Tritos Pass, if you're driving, keep your eyes ahead on the road, but let the passenger look to the left and you'll see conglomerate um, all through there. And we know the Harvati Quarry, northeast of the village of Mycenae, as you ascend up the road to the Ayos Yorgos and then on up to Palace there. And that's, you can see the remains of the quarry marks there for the quarrying of these constructions at Mycenae in conglomerate. There's also a Paleogaloro quarry uh, further up and one at Priftiani over to the east. So there are multiple quarries for this and in a study that Louis Hitchcock and colleagues did, they identified one down at Vafio Paleopirgi and wondered if that's not what was going on here, that they were cutting at least conglomerate column bases <coughs> and they, they published this uh, suggesting that might be what's going on. But most of us, when we go to Mycenae, look at the terrific uh, coarse-dressed, hammer-dressed and sawn conglomerate of the Tholos tombs, but we don't walk out to the end of the Dromos and look at the great terrace wall that if you were traversing the road up the Chaos Ravine, trying to head up to the entrance to Mycenae, you would have seen this massive, coarse, rough conglomerate masonry Plat terrace here sticking out as you looked up to the tomb up above. And as you make your way up to the palace, you actually enter a kind of dromos as if you were entering a tomb, but it's not. It's, it's lined conglomerate coarse masonry that you're all very familiar with that is a sheathing over the original limestone cyclopean wall of LH2 day. Uh, this is added then in probably in the mid LH3B period as you move into the Lion Gate. And this is all familiar to you. If you were on that road coming up and you looked at, under, as looked at the culvert 
at Ayos Yorgos, which is the road, the Mycenaean road coming from Prosumna, from the Argive Horea, and crosses over the Chaos Ravine, and we see coarse conglomerate masonry there. We see it in the postern gate, if you're coming in the back way, in those two photographs, and even in the tower of the Northeast Citadel, not to mention all of the column bases and anta uh, that are uh, dressed out in conglomerate in the palace areas uh, that are still preserved today. So when you next time you go to Mycenae, if you haven't noticed that, take a look at those bases and anta as you go through uh, from entrances from one room or one area to another, and you'll see that happening. So this local resource is one developed by Masons to elaborate in a grandiose manner the monumentality of the palace and its environs. And it's extended outwards, I think, as an exercise and demonstration of Mycenaean control in the hammer-dressed and sawn conglomerate Steintor entrance at Tiryns, which Heinrich Sulza re restored in the Tiryns three volume in 1930 with a great conglomerate lintel over the top, and he put a, another Lion Gate uh, relief in there. Who knows? It doesn't, we have no trace of it today. It's interesting, the flanking approach to it, our dressed limestone cyclopean forecourt on both sides, and that is a very formalized way of bringing to your attention the, the, the conglomerate gate as it stands before you. So this is a very formal property at work here. And if you go up to the Larissa, the next time you go in, if you hadn't ever noticed, when you go into the Larissa uh, to look at the remains there, there's a Mycenaean fortification wall that's surrounding it, and there's a huge Mycenaean threshold that's on the interior. Uh, and, and that threshold may have been crowned by a conglomerate Asher masonry lintel that's built into the Ottoman Venetian wall on the outside. It could have come from a Tholos tomb, but we don't have a Tholos tomb in the area. I'd like to think that it was part of the arrangement of that Mycenaean fortification on top of the Larissa. So these would be ways in which masonry traditions are represented at Mycenae. Uh, uh, carrying forward the grandiosity in the 3B in the 13th century of the dynasts who are ruling there. And it all comes together around the Lion Gate and its uh, marvelous sculpture that Nick Blackwell has uh, explained to us for the first time by getting up and actually looking at all of the traces of its construction. When he got up on a ladder and started photographing it, what he saw were hundreds of drill holes and saw marks that represented bronze drills that were used to shape the structure, the form of the lions flanking the uh, Minoan altars that they stand on and flanking the column, which is, was cut out in its first form using a pendulum saw, as seen in this diagram on the lower left by Giuliana Bianco. And this raises a really interesting question about Mycenae as a hegemony in the 13th century. Uh, Nick's continuing work, which he uh, presented at the Centenary Conference at Cambridge and then last year at an Aegean seminar in New York, um, has been to look at the reused architectural revetments that were found and are associated with the treasury of Atreus. And he's pointed out these are reused blocks that are then fashioned so they could be part of a much more ornamental facade that bespeaks architecture and the iconography of architecture, the iconography of the palace as you come in to the entrance of the tomb. So it's a palace of the dead, and if you go through the Lion Gate, it's the palace of the living. And it, it's, it's uh, extremely interesting, not least of which because we know that there are architectural revetments from Knossos. They're on display in the museum in Heraklion, and we get the Minoan triglyph motif and rosettes, as you see in the photograph at the right. So these are all interesting references to Minoan features of decoration that are part of the, probably the architectural splendor that dressed up the palaces and particularly the palace at Knossos, and are appropriated and reused 
in a way that fits within Mycenaean masonry display that is claiming Knossos, particularly at Mycenae, but also at Tiryns. Nick Blackwell was interested in how this all comes to be. The pendulum saw is really interesting, and if you haven't read the article in Antiquity or watched the video, he decided to build one, because Michael Cooper had identified this uh, out of work that various other German scholars had, had carried forward uh, and, and suggested the armature of these was three, four, or five meters. Nick decided to build one to see how it would cut and he experimented with different kinds of blades because he wanted to see how these cuts, as you can see in the threshold and anti-blocks at Tiryns were affected and how hard it was to do that. Um, and he succeeded with the blade, as you can see in the photograph in the lower left here. Uh, this is extremely interesting work and uh, it's interesting also because it seems to be an invention. We don't, the, the, the Germans who work at Boazke in the Hittite world, they're, they're not really happy thinking that this is a Hittite product. In fact, the saw tradition is Minoan. And it may be that what we're looking at here is something the Mycenaean masons invented for their own purposes, because they loved sawing through these conglomerate blocks, and this is a way they could do it. Um, so, so I, that brings us, because it's, I just brought Boazke Hatusha into the, into, the, into the frame of reference, and it brings us back to this question of timbering, because I've already suggested to you, as I published earlier, that this is an, an Anatolian tradition. And it raises this question about well, how, how were these craftspersons learning these technologies, and what were they inventing? And that takes us particularly to the Corbel Cyclopean Masonry at Tiryns and Mycenae, and I'm sure you all remember that Pausanias tells us that the tradition was that Lycians built these great buildings. And there's even, I couldn't find the illustration, there's even a marvelous uh, red figure vase that shows Athena carrying a great big block on her back, probably building the Acropolis walls at, my, at, at, at Athens itself. But the corbelling tradition is very specific to the Archelid, particularly to Tiryns. And we all know that Eastern storage rooms with their long vaulted corridor, and then this very elaborate entrance to the fountain at Mycenae, the Persea fountain. And as Moran and anyone who studied Anatolian architecture would know, but the real comparison here is between Postern III at Boazke Buyukaya, and we actually have something like this at Ugarit as well, and the Tiryns Westgate Stair, which is shown here in a photograph on the outside that shows how similar these are in relation to each other and how elaborate the interior stairway is as you go down. So they're doing really interesting corbeling. And the corbeling that we see at Tiryns is really not the same as the corbeling that we have in the Hittite lands, it's an elaboration of it. The Mycenaeans like to invent and play with things that they learned uh, from other places. So I've been building up to talking about Mycenae's claims on Knossos, and the Lion Gate is where that all centers, because the lion's paws are resting on Minoan altars, because the, 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 the porch of the Tiryns Megaron we know from the early excavations, has a rosette triglyph Minoan frieze decorating it, the Kumunos frieze, as it's called. Here's the fragment of it preserved in this photograph from Mueller's publication in 1930. These are explicit statements along with the pier and door partitions, things that we teach our undergraduate students about how the mainlanders, the Mycenaeans, are claiming, imitating Minoan architecture. But they're making specific claims on Knossos because it's about legitimacy and authority, going back to this axis mundi of the Aegean world. So it raises this interesting question that fits into the larger discussion that's happening today in Aegean prehistory was, did Mycenae become a hegemon over all the other city states or polities of the, of the mainland world, and even broader uh, outwards to places like Philocopi and uh, Crete, uh, uh, over this time. I would say that what we have here is something that smacks of certain imperial in ambition. And we're looking at it from a craft perspective, 
Cyclopean limestone and conglomerate coarse masonry in the LH3B period. Inspired craft technologies derived from Hittite ones, the bronze drill, megalithic corbelled constructions, uh, timber casemates with rubble interior, for rubble interiors derived from an Anatolian tradition. The revetments and architectural features that are taken from Crete and built into the palaces or the tombs. The pendulum saw as an invention that's derived probably actually from a Cretan tradition and technology. After all, the Cretans were recognized as the Kaftor, and these people are known for their technological abilities. So when we go back to this diagram and add in the Egyptians and the Hittites, we have the Kaftor Keftiu references that go way back. And then we have the interesting documents that refer during the monopalatial period probably to Ahia with this person Atarisia in the monopalatial period where the seat was at Knossos. But then the seat shifts, and I think it shifts precisely and decisively to Mycenae. And they're struggling always to reclaim that position with the kings of the Near East, the Ahiyawa, who are not clearly understood, but are in relationship to the Hittites in some way. But it doesn't have to be direct. It can be a process of, of indirection and part of the tradition that informs a, a Mycenaean palace, the core of which, as I said, is a rubble masonry corridor house build a tradition that's elaborated and takes over the seat of power at the throne room at Knossos. And I just remind you of the camp stool fresco at Knossos, which is LM3, and it has people drinking out of a Mycenaean goblet on the one hand and a Minoan chalice on the other. And these processions for these built environments for the palaces are very important because they're displays of authority, legitimacy, and power displays, in fact, of ritual action that bring myth and legend alive as the procession is activated. And so the ritual processions that we see painted in the corridors at Knossos are also those that we see painted in the corridors at Thebes, Pylos, Tiryns. And we might think of the Mycenae cult center because if you see the little red circle there of that male figure who's walking with a servant holding a parasol over his head, that person is holding a figurine or a homunculus in front of him. Is it one of these figures from the cult center? Interesting. <laughs> formal processions. Formal processions are an activation of ritual and myth through images. And Yosef Moran has argued something that anyone who looks can see, that the processional path up the ramp at the outside adherence and through the gate wall into the corridor that leads through the Stein Tor and goes progressively inner and inner to through gates, through Popila to courtyards, and then turning right into another courtyard, and then turning right and getting into the main courtyard where there's an altar in the center that's right on axis with the great Megaron. All of this is dressed out in this monumental architectural forms that I've been talking about. And then in the frescoed forms that, that also bring it into your vision as you move through it in a procession that's ritualized. Uh, as we know from the decorated floors as you come into the inner room of the, of the Megaron itself. And that's extremely well understood at Tiryns, equally well understood, but slightly differently at Pylos, where you have another painted stucco floor and a throne or a place for emplacement of a throne where offerings could be poured into a plaster basin and flowed off to the side, and also a place that seems to favor the griffin rather than the lions that we see uh, at, at Mycenae. But Mycenae was the central place, I think. It's historical, and the procession through Mycenae, like the one at, at Tiryns, is very similar and yet different because it is historical and it's oriented to the symbol of the dynas, as Milanas called it, the heraldic device of the Lion Gate itself. And as you pass through, what you have that you don't have at the other citadels is this reconstructed and raised up, repurposed 
and presented to you dynastic burial center of the grave circles with the stele standing and oriented to your vision as you step through the gate. You're right on axis to look to it. Uh, that's remarkable because it also is part and parcel of the cult center. And if you were in the cult center with one of those figures in a procession, you could process upwards out from the ramp up a uh, cut limestone risers, and you pass through another one of these cyclopean gates that uh, exists along that ramp that leads out of the cult center and leads probably up to the great uh, stairway uh, that leads up into the courtyard of the palace at Mycenae. So I think that the, the burden of history is really enveloped in the final architecture at Mycenae. It's, it's an important center, and it's part of this whole peer polity system. What we see is a tradition that's coming together at the end of the late Bronze Age, uh, where probably Mycenae could be viewed as a primus inter pares, among many others, in my view. I will leave it at this point, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm afraid if I went on a little bit too long, I apologize for that, but I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.